I believe we're live now. So um, first and foremost, my name is Anton Bassey. And on behalf of Ohm of Medicine, I would like to welcome everybody with, to the uh, GROW Seminar with DJ Short and also fundraiser for the PCAP. Uh, before we begin, we're going to get into a few uh, talking points. And then after that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, DJ. We've been hosting DJ Short for uh, the last eight years, and it's it's been a relationship where we, we wanted to educate our patients and guests on the amazing power of cultivating cannabis on your own. Uh, we we advocate hard. We advocate hard for the uh, the right to home grow, and during these times especially, we want to make sure everyone is equipped with the tools to be self sufficient and to cultivate a deeper relationship to the plant we all know and love. For the event, we have teamed up with the Prisoner, well, not Prisoner, Prison Creative Arts Project to raise funds for their amazing work. So instead of paying for the entry fee for the seminar, we ask that you will donate to the PCAP. The Prison Creative Arts Project brings those impacted by the justice system and the University of Michigan community into artistic collaboration for mutual learning and growth. We are proud to partner with the Prison Creative Arts Project as a way to extend compassion to those impacted by the criminal justice system. We believe in supporting the rehabilitation and re-entry of those incarcerated. Using art as a tool to provide opportunity and inspiration is a mission we fully support. The drug war has negatively impacted families and communities for decades. As we work to dismantle prohibition, we are constantly striving for new and unique ways to bring these efforts full circle. We have amazing sponsors for this event, including Redemption Cannabis, Driven Grow, and Grow Green Michigan. <laughs> we also have two raffles happening tonight. Once you donate to PCAP, send us a screenshot of your receipt and you will be entered to win with, uh, with uh, two of our starter kits for your home grow. And without further ado, I am going to turn things over to DJ Short. Oh, there we go. No, I'm not. Hey, how's everybody doing? Here we go. All right, so we just uh, dive into this, I guess, and, and away we go. Um, like I said, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, I like to cover a few points um, just to kind of get things out of the way and, and important talking points I like to share with people. Um, and just as a, as a disclaimer, this isn't really a, uh, an entire GROW seminar. I'm not going to go through that step by step. I'm going to talk about some other things, things that are important uh, to know about quality of herb. We're going to talk about the differences between indica and sativa, uh, those kinds of things. And um, I'll, I'll run through a kind of a brief synopsis of how my breeding regimen works um, it's all kind of cut and dry and basic, and I have some visual aids here uh, to help with that. And what we'll do is I'll just prattle on for a bit about these things that I want to uh, cover and get out of the way. Uh, we'll take a little break, I, I'd say about an hour. Um, I can usually cover this. And then after that, whatever anybody wants to talk about, we have the uh, live comments section going on here. So if you have specific questions, um, you can post them there and we'll see about answering any specific questions. And we can talk about uh, specific growing uh, techniques and things at, at that point in time. I just like to save that for uh, people who, uh, you know, have, have that uh, quest for knowledge uh, going on at the time. Uh, most everything about growing you can find out. There, there's just tons of information online um, and everywhere. Uh, but again, if there are specific things you'd like to know about, then uh, by all means, uh, pose a question and we'll, we'll get to that. And, and I always start these lectures with sort of an ethical uh, piece just concerning our whole industry. I mean, we're, we're in a really strange place having been, you know, denied and, and deemed illegal for so long and now coming into the light out of the darkness. 
Um, we're, we're still not fully there yet. We're working on that process. But I like to remind people about something. And it has to do with when, when I'm asked the question a lot of the time, uh, how did you come up with the blueberry? How, do, how did you do this? So on an ethical note to that, when I examined it and, and really looked at the bigger picture of things, what I, I realized was is that the blueberry or the strains that I do choose for what I consider to be quality um, were the ones that best helped me heal. The key word is healing. And I think it's important for people to remember that because as we come out of the darkness, out of the shadows and into the light, there are a lot of people that are still very much afraid of what this represents, this, this level of freedom that we're attempting to um, experience. And so it helps to have this, uh, this term and, and this, this concept under our belts and well understood as we move forward. Um, it's the blueberry is the one that helped me feel best. And basically blueberry is my evening smoke. That's the one that relaxes me the most flow is my day smoke. There's different types of smoke for different times of, of day and circumstances and whatnot. But remembering that, remembering that what this plant is key in, in human evolution, it just aids our healing in so many ways. And it's such a benign, harmless, helpful uh, substance. Uh, so I just like to pass that on. And when you are dealing with people going into the future, as we do see more light of day coming out of these dark ages, um, to remember that. And, and this concept of healing is very, very important. Um, so yeah, bear, bear that in mind uh, as we go forward. So Going, stepping from there, it's kind of a broad jump here, but I like to go into what is uh, the, what is quality cannabis? What does, what does quality mean? And the one thing I like to point out to people is, you know, again, if you ask me, how, how do I judge my herb? How do I come to these determinations about these things? Um, and it has to do with, um, with how I judge herb. Um, now, you, you, you know about judging herb when we see cannabis cups and things of that nature, but uh, cups are fun parties and, and they're great get togethers, wonderful networking, but they are not the best way to judge herb. Judging herb takes a long, long time. Um, and I have to say that you know, the bulk and majority of when I make a selection um, concerning cannabis and a particular cultivar or strain that I'm working with, um, it, it has to do with the effect of the finished product on my body. That is first and foremost. One of the mistakes I see people make, uh, Latter-day breeders and, and, you know, people trying to do the right thing is people tend to fall in love with the plant in the grow room. And I am going to caution you to be wary of that. And you have to wait. There is no other way about it. That plant that maybe wasn't your favorite to grow may end up being your favorite to smoke. And you're not going to know that until the process is complete and everything is done, said and done and, and out of the way um, before that can happen. It's, it's after it's cut and cured. And um, if we want to talk about curing, we can, we can do that later as well. Um, but it's important to remember that, that you, you have to wait until everything is cut, dried, cured, ready to go. And then I smoke it and I see how it makes me feel. Um, there are a number of different techniques, different um, things that I, I utilize. There, I have what I call five objective uh, points that I, I look for. And they're very basic, simple. Several of them involve nothing more than a, a clock or a stopwatch. And they go in this order. I'll start with number one which is onset. So I'm in a baseline state. 
And it's important to realize what baseline state is. That means I'm not experiencing an altered sense of consciousness from any other um, substance. And I'm in my baseline state and I will, bong hits are my preferred method of of consuming herb anyhow. One thing I will differentiate here, just so we know the difference between flour and concentrate. Uh, they're the two, two different, different things. Um, so bear that in mind going forward. But number one is onset. And onset means how long after I take my initial bong hit from my baseline state, do I reach that full state of um, altered consciousness that I, I get from consuming the herb. And it varies from strain to strain, and it can vary very much. Um, certain strains, heavy hitting indicas on one side of the fence and the lighter, headier sativa on the other and everything in the middle. Uh, but the heavy hitting indicas generally tend to be uh, a bit quicker of an onset. Sometimes as I'm exhaling the bong hit, I can be like, whoa, okay, that's hitting me. Um, whereas other strains, I'll, I'll take that bong hit and maybe get some flavor aspect of it. Uh, but I really don't get a full and complete effect from it. It's full effect for upwards of 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Some strains as long as a half hour or 45 minutes. Flow is like that. Flow takes a good at least half hour to fully come on to uh, its, its full effect. And um, which also kind of explains why I don't enter a lot of those types of things into a cup because at a cup it's, it's one joint after another, one toke after another, all kind of melding into and bleeding into one another. Um, so that onset is my first, you know, look at the clock. How long does that actually take? And sometimes you may think you're there. You may think you're there in five minutes or in 10 minutes, but when you look at that clock in 20 minutes and go, whoa, wait a minute, I'm, I'm still kind of going up here. Um, and when I finally reach that plateau where, yes, this is the peak, the pinnacle of the experience I'm going to have with this, what time is it on the clock? How long did that take? That is onset. That's number one. Number two goes hand in hand with it. Duration. How long does it last? Some strains, the effect lasts much longer than others. Some are very short. Again, the heavy hitting indicas tend to be uh, a bit more uh, quick in, in their effect, sometimes as fast as a half hour, maybe as short as an hour. Whereas a nice soaring sativa um, flow, again, in particular, three to four hours after I have indulged, I can still sense the quality of that product and what it's how it's affecting my body. So we're talking anywhere from an, uh, you know, half hour to an hour before we're coming down and settling back toward baseline um, to uh, three, four hours. Um, some strains even go uh, beyond that. So we have onset and duration. Those are the uh, first two. Uh, the third one I refer to as ceiling. And ceiling has to do with the more I consume, more bong hits I take, the farther I, I tend to go. Um, and there's difference between certain herbs. Again, very cut and dry with the um, indica versus sativa, whereas uh, heavy hitting indica, you know, three or four hits, and I'm not going to get any more of an altered state of consciousness, any more inebriated. Uh, than I already am. And um, whereas others, certain soaring sativas, again, uh, you can you can go and go and just keep going and keep keep getting higher and higher to the point of uh, almost a psychedelic uh, type of a reaction like LSD or mushrooms or something like that. Um, so uh, those are three so far, uh, onset, duration, ceiling. If I keep puffing, do I keep getting higher or do I hit that ceiling and, and not go any farther? Um, the fourth thing takes a bit of time. Uh, and that the fourth thing is um, shelf life. Um, the uh, duration of that uh, experience. Uh, how long is that herb good in that jar? 
And again, uh, quite a difference between indica and sativa again, where the indicas generally tend to burnout. The other word is burnout that we like to use here. Um, before I'm burnt out on that experience, been there, done that, don't want to do it anymore. Um, and, and, you know, how long, uh, does it last, uh, through that jar? A good cure really helps with, um, with, with, with that aspect of it, the, uh, uh, shelf life, um, well, actually, the uh, let me back up here a minute. The fourth one, the fifth one is shelf life. That's how long it lasts in the jar. The fourth one is tolerance threshold, and that's um, the burnout factor. Um, the shelf life, the fifth one, is just how long the bud lasts in the jar. Uh, again, certain indicas six months to a year, and they're already breaking down. Whereas a soaring sativa, just like in the wine and spirits industry, the um, sativa will sort of gain uh, quality aspects of it. Character is the term used in the wine and spirits industry over time. Um, some of my favorite herb are some of my more soaring sativas that are cured for several years, two, three years um, in a jar. And... Uh, it brings out, well, actually, it, it sort of cuts out certain characteristics that are more uncomfortable and certain aspects of the character then shine even greater. One thing with uh, the shelf life aspect and proper storage is we get the chlorophyll to break down. The green matter starts to go more brown um, and, and um, the... Uh, greener flavors, those more bitter flavors tend to go away, and some of those uh, sweeter um, flavors tend to shine um, with with proper storage. Now, on top of all these, so that's the five, which was onset duration, um, sealing, your tolerance threshold or burnout, and then um, shelf life. The overall of course, um, aspect that we're all kind of looking for is potency, right? And potency, again, it's, it's in my opinion, it's one of these double-edged swords. There's much more going on with the herb than just basic potency. Um, the uh, hard-hitting indicas tend to be more potent at first. They have more of a inebriating effect than say some of the soaring sativa, again, unless you go past that ceiling and, and find yourself in, in a situation, unfamiliar territory, so to speak, and um, trying to get our, 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 wits, our wits about us. So, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second here, but just to bear that in mind, that potency is not everything in this game. I know it's it's a big factor right now in terms of price point, especially when we can go in and have our um, products tested in laboratories to determine THC uh, levels, which are primarily responsible for potency. But there are other things going on um, to bear in mind. So as far as um, good herb is concerned, there's a, a little phrase, an, an old friend of mine named Abraxas uh, told me when I asked him about this, what, what do you, how do you refer to good herb? And he gave me this line. He said, oh, that's easy. He said, that's the one that gives me the warm and fuzzy hug from within. So it's whatever floats our boat, basically. And I don't want to rail too heavily on, on potency. It's not my cup of tea, but as far as what good herb is, that's up to the individual. That's up to you. You know what you like. Same can be said for wine and spirits, you know, uh, what people's preferences are there. It's just that with cannabis, we have such a broader um, effect range, boundaries of effect that, that, you know, some take you up, some take you down, some are visual, some are mental, uh, some are relaxing, whereas others are by far more stimulating. Um, we have a much greater range of effect. Now, with alcohol, the only uh, thing I can relate to in that capacity is how you know, most alcohol just gets me drunk. 
if I do too much, except for something like tequila. Uh, I can get myself in trouble with tequila. Well, it's the same with herb, all right? And, and it's important to remember that it's what the individual prefers. I like to use the example that, you know, people who are using herb medicinally, especially for something like limiting one's opiate intake, if a person is, you know, unfortunate enough to have to take opiates for pain, um, and certain cannabis can help with that, where the cannabis can uh, help alleviate the pain as well as, if not better than, the opiate at certain times, well, then by all means, that individual is going to appreciate that heavy hitting indica. All right. Whereas I think, you know, most people who aren't looking for those types of relief are just looking for that warm, fuzzy hug from within, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, so knowing, knowing that and, and, granting leeway to people who are looking for specific traits from cannabis, we have to understand there's a market for it all. There is most definitely, um, you know, uh, uh, somebody out there that's going to want some aspect that the rest of us might not be that uh, interested in. Like myself, I'm not that terribly interested in potency. Another interesting side note with potency is back in the day, some of the original uh, sativas of yore that I am in essence trying to replicate with what I've been doing. And in all honesty, I have to say I've not succeeded yet. We get close. I get facets of it, little pieces of it. But the Oaxacan, the gold Oaxacan I smoked, or the Acapulco gold, or that Highland Thai herb, we're talking about herb now, concentrates, or a different story, um, those were very, very special. We, we have not replicated them. I don't believe we ever will be able to replicate those things uh, here domestically just simply because we don't have the environment. And I'll get to that um, in a minute as well. I just want to uh, clarify some of these terms I've been using. Um, so understanding what good herb is for the individual is, is, is very important. And to realize that, you know, one person's delight might be another person's garbage and vice versa. One person's garbage might be another person's delight. That all remains to be seen. Just like we have to wait until the flower is ripe and harvested and cured and smoked in order to be able to judge it. Um, it it's along those uh, same lines. So. Um, having kind of touched on, on those things, and there's a, a bunch of other things I could, I could delve into, and I probably will. I just want to stay on the flow of this, um, what we're doing right now. Um, and I've talked so far a lot about the differences between indica and sativa. So let's get to the nuts and bolts of, of what, what is the difference between indica and sativa? We know things like, oh, well, wide leaves represent indica and skinny leaves represent sativa. For the most part, yes, that's a, you know, kind of a rule of thumb, but it's, there are exceptions to that. Um, there are thin leaved indicas and there are wide leaved sativas. Uh, it's rare, but they do happen. Primarily and mainly the difference between indica and sativa is this. Sativa came from the tropics, all right? Indica came from outside of the tropics. And I actually brought a globe, let me reach over here and get this, to um, get an idea of, of what we're talking about here. So here's our wonderful planet Earth and everything in the screen goes backwards on me, so I'm working on figuring that out. Uh, anyhow, um, this line right here in the middle, we see going around, of course, that's the equator. That's in the center of the earth. And we spin on our axis up here at the North Pole and the South Pole. And in the middle, we've got the equator. And on any globe, if you look up, you'll see like right up here, you can't see it too clearly. Oh my God, they've got, I just bought this globe at a yard sale and I see that we have Columbus on here. So 
I'm sorry, I should have X that out prior to this. We're <laughs> kind of over Columbus, I think. Anyhow, um, this little dotted line up here is the Tropic of Cancer. And then we have another dotted line down here that is the um, Tropic of Capricorn. All right. It is this area between here and here, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, that is the area that is referred to as the tropics. All right. Now, the tropics are unique on planet Earth. And I'm going to come on to Africa here because Africa is very important and significant because Africa is the largest landmass on the planet. In, within the tropics. Everywhere else, you'll notice, I mean, if we come over here, we it's going through the upper part of South America. It goes up to uh, central uh, Mexico, Oaxaca and that area, and then down to, oh, what are we going through in South America? Uh, Paraguay and, and northern Chile, southern Brazil, places like that. Now, what it is about the tropics is that that is the only place on the face of planet Earth that uh, gets direct overhead sunlight, where the sunlight shines down on there directly. And why that's important, what that does is it's not being filtered by the atmosphere. When we go out of the tropics and the sun is coming through, um, the atmosphere on an angle like such, it's going through much more of the atmosphere that is filtering out a lot of that ultraviolet radiation. And it's ultraviolet radiation, I believe, in my, my, I think, in my opinion anyhow, and, and other scientists, is what made these tropical sativas so special. The plant adapting to and, and compensating for that intense sunlight coming through uh, less of the atmosphere. Now, add to that uh, elevation and we increase the UV radiation even more. We're, we're cutting out even more of the atmosphere and more of that light is coming through unfiltered. The, there are a few exceptions to this, one of which... God, everything's going backwards again, is just north of India here is Nepal. Nepal, there it is right up in here. Nepal is technically just outside of the tropics, but due to the Himalaya, the Himalayan mountains, they have the elevation, so they have extremely high um, ultraviolet radiation. And it's this ultraviolet radiation that plays upon the oils and cannabinoids in the plant that give us that warm and fuzzy hug from within, among other things. Um, so um, it's also very important to note uh, the glandular stalk trichome, all right? And um, I should have had that ready here. Where did my thing go? Here we go. Uh, I'll just draw one up really quick. Boom surface of the leaf and then I can point this out. Uh, this right here is the surface of the leaf, right? And we have the stalk that comes up uh, and then the big head that is filled with the oils. It has a membrane around it. Um, the glandular stalk trichome, this is what we're trained, we've been taught to look for on our plants. Um, but in my opinion, and again, in a few other scientists' opinion, this structure of uh, cannabinoid concentration was bred for specifically outside of the tropics for um, concentrate, for hashish production. In the tropics, um, what we have going on there, we have the surface of the leaf. Um, uh, we used to see this back in the day, our hairs. And here we got the surface of the leaf again and a hair that's kind of bulbous at the bottom that is filled with oil. These hairs are also filled with oil. And every now and then, um, when I would look at them through a microscope, I just drew on here, um, this is the oil actually secreting right out of the hair down onto the surface of the leaf. And this is what I witnessed going on in uh, the sativa plants, uh, more so than these uh, glandular stalk trichome that we see upon the indica plants. 
And those people outside of the tropics, and we can just name them uh, Morocco, uh, Lebanon, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan. These are the places where um, the glandular stalk trichome is, is concentrated into hash, usually through some form of dry sieving. We use a dry sieve or we could use ice water uh, bubble bags, those, those types of methodologies. At any rate, in the tropics, uh, there's still hashish, but the main form of collecting that hash in the tropics is hand rubbing the plant, hand rubbing a live plant that is still in the ground. All right, collected on the hands and then rubbed off of the hands and then concentrated into piles that way. Now, um, Yes, the glandular stalk trichome and seeing many of them through a magnifying loop is indicative um, of potency that we do see, but there is also some of this potency coming from the oil that's directly dropped onto the leaf surface from the uh, systolithic hairs or the secretory hairs, the hairs that secrete the oil. And I think that um, we're kind of overlooking a lot of things uh, which is why I consider this to be an important talking point to bring up in, in these lectures, that there is this other aspect going on, that there are these other oils that aren't just in the glandular stalk trichome. Uh, so that's important to know. Uh, again, Nepal is, is an exception to this, where the main form of hashish collection in Nepal is through hand rubbing of plants. And I've heard uh, pretty well verified rumors. I've seen photographs and I've heard from uh, trustworthy people that this is going on. I've never been there personally to witness it myself. It's on my bucket list. Nepal is one of the places I wanna go to along with Peru. Um, but in Nepal, supposedly uh, the local people there uh, using this methodology have been able to keep certain plants, singular plants, alive for upwards of four years outdoors. And as we all know, cannabis is primarily a perennial plant. It's one season. We plant it in the spring. We harvest it in the fall. Um, but these people who are utilizing this hand rub methodology in Nepal uh, are somehow keeping their plants alive for upwards of four years. And I've seen photographs of these plants and they are enormous. They are 25 feet tall and 25 feet wide. They're the size of a house, basically. Um, and, and they just keep going. And the methodology there in a place like Nepal, it's tribal. Uh, it's more the village mentality, the village politics, so to speak. And I believe it's, or I think it's the elders, it's mainly the elders who, who make these decisions, the people that have been watching this for a, a long time um, make this happen. And they will, uh, you know, study the plants, inspect the plants, and on a given day, they'll look at the plant and go, oh, okay, you're about ready to rub. And they will inform the people in the village, ah, tomorrow we rub, tomorrow we rub, and everyone gets up before the sun early in the morning. Uh, the best harvest time is before the light comes, before uh, dawn, so to speak, um, or before the lights come on uh, in the grow room, simply because one of the breakdown factors for the cannabinoids and the terpenes is uh, light. So we want to be pulling those down uh, uh, prior. So the elder or, you know, in, in certain areas referred to as the hashish babar, B-A-R-B-A-R, um, -A -R -B -A -R, um, will tell the people tomorrow we rub, people get up before dawn, they start rubbing that plant. And it's a live plant, it's in the ground, generally speaking a female, um, and they collect that resin on their hands. The plant looks terrible. The plant gets all beat up and the leaves are broken. But within a few days, it bounces back. And I'm wondering if, if this uh, contact with humans, because not only are we um, getting the oils off the plant, 
that plant is also interpreting the oils from the hands of the human beings that are rubbing it. There's a communication going on there between the two. Um, so that that's uh, a good thing to know. <clears throat> Anyhow, um, give me a second here. Oh, excuse me. Um, that is uh, an important thing that we, we need to know. Uh, and coming back to the differences between these indica and sativa, back in the day when I used to get that great sativa, and let me qualify this a, a little bit, just so you're not under a misconception that all that the great sativas of yore were great. They weren't. 90% of them were bunk, uh, C grade at best herb. Um, they came in very, very large loads, um, a hundred tons plus sometimes, uh, 80 tons were pretty common coming in on large boats offloaded with forklifts and a lot of manual labor. Um, that herb, it was commercial, very, very commercial. We used to call it dirt weed. And that was the Colombian would come in three or four finger lids. That meant how deep the buds were in the bag. It was seeded, clumps, very heavy. Sometimes there was dirt in there. Sometimes there were bugs. Sometimes there were cigarette butts, just all kinds of strange little bits of detritus floating around um, in those bags. But the quality stuff came to us in much smaller loads, usually eight tons or less, because that is what fit um, in a small fishing boat or a step van or a small aircraft that would um, transport the stuff from country of origin. And one of the groups responsible for this, if you're into history, is a group called the Brotherhood of Eternal Love or BEL, Brotherhood of Eternal Love, BEL. And they were a bunch of, you know, ragtag hippie freaks from Back in the 60s, they were uh, surfers and jocks and addicts to various things, drinking and heroin and all sorts of different things, until they discovered this good herb, number one. And in all honesty, and just so we know for the history books, number two is LSD uh, and the psychedelics, uh, mushrooms in some cases, the cactus, peyote, and uh, various things as well that changed their lives and put them on a course. And it was their goal in life then was to turn on the world. And they did a good job of it between them and Ken, Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. They pretty much lit the world on fire with this whole psychedelic revolution that began in the 60s and ran through the 70s and all the way up to now, up to present day. Um, so credit where credit's due and, and, and the brotherhood who took particular attention to detail. And I think that that's one of these, another, another very important talking point in terms of, um, rectifying or, or, um, resurrecting, I should say, excuse me, uh, the good quality herb of yore. And, you know, I hate to be the, the DJ downer about it all, but we're not, we're not going to, we cannot replicate the environment of the tropics for good herb. The side note to that is we are getting very close to replicating A-grade hash in our concentrate uh, techniques that we're utilizing and the various means of science that we're using to really um, parse out a lot of these different characteristics in the cannabinoids and the terpenes. Um, so the, the various means of extraction that we're using from the, the basic crude Simpson oil all the way through to butane, excuse me. Um, uh, and of course the high end on this is uh, CO2, um, uh, extraction to make pharmaceutically pure grades of extract. And we are, uh, doing some impressive things in those capacity. Now the herb is good. I don't mean to, to, you know, burst any bubble, anybody's bubble that much. It, it, it's just that when you, if you ever do, and I'm hoping that at some point in time we do again, as, as things like export and import open up on these tropical sativa and we can finally 
uh, get to sample those while we're here. If there's any old timers in the crowd who are from back in the day that you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and it's a shame. The, the last good herb that came through was about 1981, 82. Uh, there was enough of it in storage to last a little while. The last good hash came through about 85 and 86. What ended the last good hash was the Russian occupation of Afghanistan, and it just became impossible to get in and out of there. And the Brotherhood, you know, I like to talk a little bit about them just to, again, give credit where credit is due and their importation scheme, because it's a nice little uh, side note on this. But they would just uh, fly from here, you know, with their cash to um, Frankfurt, Germany was one of the main hubs. There were, there were others, but Frankfurt, Germany was a good place to start. They would go there, use some money to buy a nice Volkswagen van. They would then drive that Volkswagen van to Kabul, Afghanistan, which you can do from Frankfurt, Germany. You can drive to Afghanistan. And they would meet the Hashish Babar and, you know, make their presence known. And the Hashish Babar, the people that were doing these the, the business in these in these places were used to seeing it all. I mean, they're they're old time Silk Road um survivors and, and occupants and and they understand this whole concept of what what commerce is in in uh, in our business so when the brotherhood first showed up the hashish babar was you know oh gringos okay and the um quality that they sold was never the best you don't ever sell the best at first um, you always go a few rungs down. So they were making a deal with the Brotherhood for this C-grade uh, Afghani hash. And I'll just say C-grade Afghani hash is pretty good. That would still be A-grade hash here today, just so you know. Um, and they were ready to make their deal, and they're sitting around the, the, the fire at night having dinner, smoking the chillums and whatnot, and the, the Hubble bubbles, and getting stoned and the brotherhood did something that none of the other gringos Europeans or anybody else did. They brought the LSD and they turned the hashish babar on to the LSD. And as the uh, elder was getting off on the acid, he realized that these people weren't average people. They were into a much greater spiritual realm and as this, the rumor goes, as the story goes, the, you know, oh, no, the deal's off. No, no. And everyone was put off. What do you mean the deal's off? They thought he was freaking out on the ass. And he goes, no, no, no. You, you don't get the C grade. You get the B grade this time. Because uh, the Afghans knew that most of the, uh, you know, uh, Europeans and, and various people that were coming through, most of them wouldn't survive. They wouldn't make it to the border. And that's what they thought about the Brotherhood. So they didn't want to waste their good stuff, you know, getting confiscated on the way out. But they knew the Brotherhood because of the psychedelic reality had their act together. <laughs> they made it there on that. Um, so they, they got a little bit of a, of a better deal. And, and the Brotherhood just did this everywhere they went. They were collecting then the seeds from Afghanistan and Lebanon and Morocco, and they were taking them to Oaxaca and Thailand and places like that and getting these grows going, taking care of the people that were doing the growing, paying them fairly, um, uh, apart from having to grease the palms of all the cops and politicians that they had to get through in order to make this happen. And so they developed a rapport, a good, a good rapport. And that rapport came all the way back with them to the people that, that were then distributing their product, the, uh, the distribution networks that developed here in the States and in Europe. Um, and it was all a, a nice, happy, hippie, freaky festival for a long time, um, for as long as we could get away with it. So I'm hoping that someday we get back to that point um, that we can, a, a, as, a, as a world population, sample those great things that were, were missed uh, from back in the day. I know I, I sure am looking forward to it. And I know that they're still out there um, as well. Uh, the little, little things, subtle little things, like prior to the Brotherhood, 
um, on some of the bigger mass loads and the way that, that cannabis was uh, imported, the herb anyhow, the flower, was in bricks. It was in these compressed bricks, very tightly pressed compressed bricks where a kilo, 2.2 pounds, was about the size of a standard brick. Well, the Brotherhood, you know, kind of saw that this was hinge, you know, affecting the quality of that finished product. So they brought along with them a, a different means of compacting, uh, which was a Sears trash compactor. And after the Brotherhood, uh, you know, entered the, the field, uh, the bricks went from the size of a brick to about the size of a, a, a cushion or about the size of this pillow right here. Um, so it had a little, a little more space in it, yet it was still compressed and that upped the quality just so much. And it, it, it's very difficult to explain this in, in words. It's like trying to describe what a psychedelic experience is like. There's really not words to wrap around it is once you have that experience, you go, Oh my God, this is what I like. This is what I've been missing. And we have, we have pieces of that. We have facets of that in terms of what we're doing. But I think we've been blindsided by uh, this whole potency aspect and to realize that there are these other things. Back in the day, the great herb, that Highland Oaxacan, the, the uh, Santa Marta gold, the Colombian gold, um, were tested by the government that would, you know, when they got busted, it was the only time they got tested really. Um, and we're coming in at like 7% THC. And yet that was some of the finest herb I had ever smoked. They said back in the day that some of the most potent stuff that they ever tested was the Maui Waui from uh, Hawaii. And that was coming in at 10% uh, THC. So this what we have been taught to about the entourage effect and entourage means all of the cannabinoids, the THC, the CBD, the CBG, the CBA, CBC, all of those different things, including all of the terpenes, which are the aroma and, and the smells in there have to do with the effect of that finished herb. There are many, many subtleties at play in terms of our finished product, which is why I started out um, describing that we need to wait until we are sampling that finished product, sitting there with the stopwatch, going through the full hour um, or, or however long it takes to determine what we like, to give it that months. It takes me months to judge an herb in terms of the threshold, uh, tolerance threshold and burnout factor. Um, so uh, in regard to that burnout factor, I have to sample it in the morning, in the early afternoon, late afternoon, evening, different methods, a joint, a pipe, a bong, a vaporizer. How, however, am I testing this? And then over all this period of time, and I can say this, I can say this with all honesty right now that I've been smoking this, the particularly, the particular blueberry that I smoke right now, I sort of made in uh, 97, 1997 and 98. Blueberry first came to me uh, the end of the 70s, very early, 1980, 1981 was the first time I'd uh, come up with it. And I, there were different uh, new uh, uh births of it uh, in various strains through the years. But the one I'm smoking right now, it's the same mother, the same father since uh, 1997, 1998. And it takes me half as much to get that same effect. Uh, so that indicates to me that, oh my, yes, we're, we're beyond the uh, tolerance threshold. Tolerance threshold is very important, I think, and it's going to be very important going into the future in terms of the product that people are buying off the shelf in the dispensaries. Um, certain names, like right now it's Cookies is the big name and, and Glues, the Gorilla Glues and whatnot. And that's because uh, people go in, they buy that, they take it home, and they have that effect. It does, they're not burnt out on it. And if they go back to that dispensary and, they, and if they get the same thing, a lot of times it's not the same thing when you go back to the dispensary. It was either grown a different way or it's an entirely different uh, genetic 
thing that has the same name. So it's kind of a, a caveat emptor, buyer beware um, on, on a lot of those uh, aspects of it. Um, but that's why some of these strains, I think, are successful when it is that strain and it is grown and cured in the same way and people go back and they get that same effect and it's not burning them out, they will come back and buy more, right? Uh, return customers. In terms of my seed business, uh, for the longest time now, since I've kind of been public with it, uh, which has been since the uh, late 80s, early 90s, um, bulk and majority of my uh, customers have been return customers. People that want that same thing and have had uh, bad experiences with, with other products and they come back and they get the consistency uh, that, that I can offer. Consistency is another very important word in this, to be able to do this over and over again in the exact same form consistently is, is very important. So once you get that, you know, home run out of the ballpark with, with your strain and your grow technique, maintaining that is, is very important in terms of maintaining that spot in the marketplace. Um, so basically, Indica versus sativa, we touched on that. Again, there's there's so many different things. When I when I'm in the class, there's there's other things that come up that uh, remind me of that. So if anyone out there, you know, d does have specific things you want to know about, just uh, drop the the question in there. Actually, I should be on the live comments. There we go. Um, and plus, if I can't answer your question, that's a great thing about this class. Someone in it generally can so it, it it it's a it's a good concentration of knowledge um the other thing uh that i wanted to share and this is a uh, kind of comes at the end of the uh indica sativa difference in that in the tropics when we're in the tropics and we got that direct sun overhead that bounces between tropic of Cap capricorn and tropic of cancer to the north um the light cycle in the tropics is much more subtle than outside of the tropics. When we are uh, here in this middle part and you're going from spring to fall, say, in the northern hemisphere, uh, north of the equator, that difference in timing is very subtle. It's very slight. It's not very much. Um, your veg lighting in, in the tropics would be um, uh, 13 hours of light and 11 hours of dark, all right? It's not 18 hours of light and six hours of dark. It's just 13 and 11. And over that six-month period of time, that will shift over to being 11 hours of light and 13 hours of darkness, all right? So that's only a two-hour shift over a six-month time period, meaning that from day to day, that day length is getting shorter at a very subtle pace, mere, um, you know, minutes or even seconds, um, depending on where you are, uh, how close to the equator. Whereas when we go way up north, up here in North America, let me get going the right way here. He's going backwards. Here we go. Uh, like up into Canada, when we get up into Canada, uh, 55 degrees north or north of there, uh, north of 55 degrees north, this time of year right now, uh, it's daylight all day. It's 24 hours, um, especially up at the Arctic Circle there. And over the next you know several months that's going to shift down to zero so we're going from 24 hours of light and zero darkness to zero hours of light and 24 hours of darkness and there can be a difference from day to day of a full 10 15 minutes in that day shortening um generally it's moving its fastest i think early september or in september around that time when the big differences in, in daylight happen. Um, so uh, that's a very important thing to note that the these differences, these subtleties in light changing in the tropics compared to the 
great differences in light changing outside of the tropics is something to bear in mind. One thing, uh, a bit of advice and information that was given to me uh, way back in the day by old timers back in the 80s um, was to make my flower cycle that we're all used to, the indoor flower cycle that I'm working with with the lights, we're all accustomed to 12 hours on, 12 hours off, which works. Um, but I highly recommend doing something closer to 11 hours of light on and 13 hours of darkness or lights off. Um, what happens is under that uh, circumstance is you will see phenotypic expressions that are not witnessed on the 12-12 cycle. They just don't happen. What causes a plant, what, what causes these subtle differences, this character to come out in the plant are environmental triggers. All right. So it's an environmental trigger that causes this reaction. Now there are a number of different environmental triggers that we can play with now that we have the technology in our indoor environment. And one of the main ones is the frequency of the light, the color of the light. It's Kelvin is what it's referred to scientifically. And there's a number on that. The higher the number, the more blue it is. The lower the number, the more red it is. My preference for the things I like, the uh, heady, soaring sativa, um, coupled with um, uh, just uh, the other uh, aspects and characteristics are due to some of these uh, uh, changes in light and uh, using blue. This is why I prefer the larger number Kelvin uh, light, um, especially in flower. And I know that the grow stores recommend using the other way around. They recommend the red light because you do get a little bit more production, I believe, that way. But you will get flavors that you do not get uh, using the blue light in, in flower, I've found, for, for my preference. The uh, um, uh, longer onset and longer duration herbs, again, the headier sativas tend to... Uh, uh, present themselves better with that environmental trigger. So given now too, we have these LED lights, which I don't have firsthand experience with, but I know a lot of people that do. Um, we are able to dial in very specific frequencies of light. I mean, there are people who are attempting to emulate the differences between spring, summer, and fall or between midday and evening and how that shifts and what effects these things have on um, that finished product. So uh, very important thing to bear in mind and, and what other environmental triggers um, are there out there for us to play with? Well, the one that I just mentioned before is that 11 on, 13 off, uh, light cycle, and you can toy anywhere in between there. It could be 11 and a half on, 12 and a half off, um, 11 hours and 20 minutes, uh, 12 hours and 40 minutes, whatever. The main thing that the old timers back in the 80s told me was just to make the light cycle a little longer than the day cycle. Not only do you save electricity, but you can actually hasten that flowering process but above everything else, you will see phenotypic expressions that you just do not see on that 12-12 life cycle. If you think about it from the plant's perspective, 12-12, it's, it's perfectly even. And from the plant, the plant's going to ask itself, you know, is this spring or is this fall? It's going to take it a while to, to figure that out. Whereas when the night is a little bit longer, that uh, communicates to the plant that, oh, by all means, this is fall, and yes, go ahead and, and finish up. So those were the main uh, points that I, I wanted to bring up. There is uh, one other thing, and I guess I'll do that now, even though we're coming up to an hour, we're going to go another five, ten minutes here so that I can show you my little methodology for breeding. And it goes something like this. I got these drawn out already. You'll see on, on this side is the female side. I always put the female 
on the left and the male on the right. I think I'm doing that right. I'm dyslexic somewhat too, so I get those mixed up sometimes. But we start with our P1s. P1 stands for the first parental generation. For me, it was the land races. And for everything that I deal with, that was Highland Thai, Chocolate Thai, um, Highland Oaxacan, and Afghan. And the Afghani plants were the indica. The other three uh, were sativa. And I went both ways. Um, I was fortunate back in the day that I had access to a good number of the indica seeds. So I was able to come up with a male indica. A lot of my contemporaries did not have that luxury. They only had the uh, female indica. Some of them only got it in clone form. So that's all they had to work with. They had to put the sativa pollen onto the indica. But I went the other way with my uh, P1s and I used the um, indica uh, male to the sativa female. All right. And what I found was in further breed work that there were many more interesting characteristics via this route um, than, than the other way. Um, so that gives, uh, you know, that's we cross the P1s together, uh, male and female, and then we end up with our F1 generation. F1 stands for the first filial. Filial is like brother, sister, uh, what that represents. Um, and this first filial generation, what I witnessed was exactly what I was supposed to witness, great uniformity. These plants were identical. They looked I, I, like Lebanese, pictures I've seen of Lebanese plants, long spear-shaped buds, medium height plants, uh, medium uh, flowering times, and uh, a cacophony of odor. It, it had all of it. It was like paint spilled in a flower factory with teas and essential oils and just all in chemicals and all kinds of weird things. So these were uniform and any two of these F1 we take, a male and a female, and we cross it, um, brings us to our um, F2 generation. All right. And it's in this F2 generation that I witnessed the um, diversity that I, I was then able to work with. And what we do from that point in time, so in this F2 generation, I'm seeing things that I've never seen before and, and being able to play with them and select them out. Uh, again, having to wait until the finished product before I can really say, oh, you are the one, meaning I had to clone all of these and the ones that didn't clone didn't end up going any further. Uh, but the ones that did, um, I was able to go further with. So in this F2 generation, from the male, from the female, I would select, just say for blueberry, uh, a very berry-leaning male and a very berry-leaning female. I would run the stem on the male or, you know, get the flowers from the female to determine, oh, you have this, you're berry-like, you have this berry. Cross to those two F2s together to come up with the F3s. And if I'm doing this correctly, when I get to the F3s and I grow them out, what I should be seeing is at least 25%, upwards of 50% of the F3s showing that berry characteristic. And what I will do then in the F3 generation is one more time. We will take that F3 berry-leaning mother and the F3 berry-leaning father and come up with the F4, all right? And then it's from these F4s that I do my selection work for the seeds that I end up finally uh, bringing to market. So we cross the F4 with the F4, a berry leaning and a berry leaning, we come up with our F5s. Now I did this intentionally at F5 because I wanted to stabilize it enough. I should say that at the F4 generation, I will see at least 50% of the progeny showing that characteristic. And then to the F5, I should be seeing 50% to at least 75%. Realistically, it's up to like 90%, 80, 80 to 90% in that F5 generation. Um, and there is still some room in there for that land race uniqueness um, beyond F5 up to about the eighth or 10th generation, somewhere in there. And they all start to look like one another. They acclimate to that indoor growing environment.
All right. I did a paper on this. It's in an O'Shaughnessy's uh, publication calling for a new classification of cannabis in that we have indica, sativa, ruderalis, and um, uh, we were calling for cannabis indoor. And it was funny, Fred Gardner is a man who helped me write that, and he did a typo on it. He called it cannabis indora, uh, which I think hey, that looks good. Uh, but we are, we're creating an entirely new cultivar in the indoor environment. And it's the outdoor environment that has all of these unique, subtle characteristics that bring things out in the herb. So as far as doing outdoor growing, which I highly recommend, especially here in Michigan, we are allowed 12 plants outdoors here in Michigan. That is just phenomenal. A lot of states don't have that much. Back in Oregon, I'm only allowed four, um, whereas here it's 12. And it is the way to go. I mean, if you do this properly, you get them out, you take care of them, uh, cover them up, have something for, for when the time comes later in the season, and you can stave off the frost uh, because you're not going to be harvesting until about mid-October, uh, mid to late October, ideally keeping them going that long, then um, we can get over a pound. We can get several pounds. I know of, uh, here in Michigan, I, I've witnessed people getting 10 pounds of flour per plant outdoors. Now, mind you, this is in a 300-gallon smart pot with special soil um, uh, and very well cared for and in a greenhouse. Uh, but it's possible. Even with without trying too hard, it, it's not difficult to get at least a pound per plant. So if you have 12 nice female clones going out in the spring, you can end up with 12 pounds in the fall. That, that's, that's a nice number. That's very handy. Um, even for a heavy smoker, that's, that's a good year's worth of, of supply. So um, growing our own is, is very important. Uh, those were most of the salient points. Um, we're coming up on the break now, after which we will field some questions. I see a bunch of them there on the side. I'm going to go use the restroom myself and let the people here uh, uh, talk to you on that. Um, that and also this, uh, the CPAP uh, or P PCAP, oh God, I forget, the, the uh, prison art uh, fundraiser that we're doing here today is, is a very good thing because we, you know, prison's not a good place to be. Um, and very, very few people that are in there actually, in my opinion, deserve to be there. Um, I think it's a terrible thing we do as a society, locking people away like that. And there are still people locked away as we speak while we're sitting here doing this webinar who are there for herb. There are still people behind bars for herb. So it's a, it's a very good and positive thing, I think, to do and to uh, uh, do that, donate, and it is PCAP. I see it now going by the bottom of my screen. Um, so uh, without further ado, I guess we'll go on to our uh, little break right now and give ourselves about five or 10 minutes here and then come back and I will field some questions for you all. So thanks for showing up and I will see you in just a few minutes. Cool, ciao, ciao. Hi everyone, I'm Anna from OM and I just wanted to take a quick second while DJ is uh, taking a quick break here to talk about an issue that we've been advocating for at OM and that is um, releasing Michael Thompson from jail. Uh, Michael is a uh, man who went to prison 25 years ago. Um, he sold some cannabis to an undercover cop and he's been in prison um, the past 25 years um, suffering from this and at risk of contracting COVID. He's obviously in his 60s, was recently diagnosed with diabetes too. Um, so if everyone could please take 
you know, a quick moment or take a screenshot of this. You can also find it on our Instagram. But if you uh, would go and call the Michigan Parole Board and demand his release, if you go to freemichaelthompson.com, you can also talk to Gretchen Whitmer, send her an email and urge his release because no one uh, deserves to have a life sentence over a cannabis crime committed um, many years ago, um, especially when it's legal now. So thank you for taking action and enjoy the rest of the live stream. My mic is muted. Hey, there I am. I am back. Cool, cool. I did see one question pop up on the screen. Someone was asking about moon. Yes, moon phases. Now we're talking old world, um, uh, not just hippie, freaky, but pagan. Yes, regarding the moon, do plants absorb light from the moon? You know, that's a good question. I don't think so. It doesn't affect the flowering. But in a lot of time, in a lot of cases, a lot of times, neither do street lights. Um, I know I've grown many plants that are near street lights, and I can see the the, the street lights on them. I'm sure it has some subtle effect. But I think that the intensity of the sun is such that the subtlety of the moon uh, doesn't doesn't uh, affect that. Now there are. Uh, old, and this, this is ancient wisdom, this is pagan, ancient pagan wisdom from, from you know, way, way back when, um, that moon phases uh, particular times to plant and to harvest. I, I'm trying to remember offhand, it's the waxing moon uh, when I sprout my seeds and when I plant my seeds, and it's the waning moon or when the moon's getting smaller, that we like to harvest, that it's getting darker now. I don't know if that has to do with the light impacting the cannabinoid and terpene profile or what, but it's it's ancient knowledge, and this isn't it's something new. Um, it's sort of the new age. The hippies and the freaks brought this back to uh, the forefront, um, but that's uh, uh, what what I recall from it, and someone else here is posting. Uh, the moon has a gravitational effect on the planet. Uh, transfer regardless. Yeah, they 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 do feel it. Um, so being aware, I think, is is the main thing, and I think that's what the greater cosmos is is more concerned with with any of us. Just that whether or not we are paying attention. Um, as far as what the specifics are, you know, we'll work that out in time. That's, that's, uh, what, what science is all about. Um, so yeah. And, uh, good question. There's a lot on the, on the subject. Um, uh, oh goodness. I forget the name of the company that publishes, uh, the book it's called a pocket astrologer and I usually get one every year and it goes through not just the moon, but all of the planetary phases along with the sun and all of the various Zodiac signs, what degree it's in. Oddly enough, the year 2020, they didn't publish a pocket astrologer and I'm kind of lost without it. It tells me when Mercury's going into retrograde and all those fun things, but all of the phases of the moon are in there in their specific uh, percentages, uh, what they are, but all of that information is available just through a, a basic search, um, uh, along with a lot of these theories regarding, uh, moon phases and planting and harvesting and watering and fertilizing and, and all those various things. Again, it's, it's a subtle, very subtle, uh, uh thing to take into consideration, but um, I, I mean, personally, I think it's very real, and I do think it has uh, something to do uh, with the finished product. I always like, you know, I go back to the, the artist side of it, because even though I uh, respect and appreciate science, I consider myself by far more of an artist. And I go back to Charlie Brown and the Peanuts with Linus and his pumpkin patch and how he would miss every Halloween because he would hang out in his pumpkin patch waiting for the great pumpkin to come and bless his pumpkins. Um, and I, I think this is kind of the same thing for cannabis. There's an old article. I, I don't think it was in High Times. I think it was in Cincinnati Tips, but it was called Sewatanero Purple. 
and about a grower down in Mexico that spent his days in his hammock and then worked with his plants at night. And one night the plants turned purple and he said, Oh, the, the angels, they came and kissed my plants last night and it made them special. It's things like that. You know, um, my advice to people in terms of us parsing all this out, figuring this out is keep good notes, keep good records on what you do. Every, every funky little thing that you do, it might seem, you know, idiotic and maybe nine out of 10 of them are idiotic, but to have that done, then, then you're like, you're like Linus with your sincere pumpkin patch. You care. And the cosmos is aware that you care. And I think there are rewards that come to that, to that caring. And I hope to see more of those uh, rewards from the, uh, the cannabis plant itself toward towards all of us but keeping those good notes also for going ahead um in in into the future um when you are going to get your license people that are going to get your license you're in line with a whole bunch of other people they try and make us compete against each other initially i think will, down the road it's going to be a moot point because demand will always outnumber supply when when our uh, marketplace is left alone, we're always going to have more demand than supply. Um, so, uh, but as we're going into it, when you're waiting in line to get your license, you're in line with all these other people and you have a stack of data points that you've been keeping and you can tell I'm old school because I do everything on paper and, and, and write it down, but it doesn't matter. It could be on your phone. It could be on whatever. And when you go to show that person you're getting your license from, well, yeah, I've, I've got all this data that I've been collecting um, that works in your favor. That shows the people issuing these licenses or anyone concerned at all that you care, that you are actually putting the effort into, you know, making, making this happen. So that's another recommendation that I give to people. Um, I do see some of the yellowish leaves. What's causing this? Sometimes a plant gets old. And the leaves turn yellow. It's it's kind of like the leaves in, in the fall. But if it's in veg and they're turning yellow, there's a number of, of different things that can do that. And in all honesty, I have to say, this is not my forte. Um, diagnosing unhealthy plants is, is, again, I'm more of an artist than a scientist. So uh, bear that in mind. Um, but there are the Jorge Cervantes in his books and he has various things. And if you just do a search on, on his grow books, he shows all of these pictures of different leaves and different states of health and sickness and what the causes of those things are. So hopefully you can, uh, um, get some idea of what it is and, and whether or not it's, it's something that's, you know, a systemic problem or is your plant just maturing because as plants mature those water leaves do turn yellow and brown and shrivel up and fall out fall off it's not a an odd thing unless it happens too early and then it's a sign of of sickness and you want to you want to deal with it usually it's either too little or too much nitrogen nitrogen is is one of those things that you know we think a little is good, then a lot must be wonderful. No, don't don't burn your your plants. Um, I'm a big fan of organic, and and organics. Um, so uh, my strains tend to reflect that, and they are newt sensitive at first. Now, if you are using a high nutrient regimen, high parts per million ppm, um, even on a sensitive plant you can graduate that plant up to that level of parts per million. Just be sure to do it gradually. If you see those leaves burning where the tips of the leaves turn uh, brown or the leaf itself starts to curl or, or uh, crumble, uh, mainly in a, in a sickly sense, um, then uh, you want to back off on that nutrient, uh, flush it a little bit. But if you raise those parts per million a little bit at a time per feeding, that plant can get used to it. They will acclimate to whatever parts per million you're, you're uh, used to using. It's just that when they're sensitive at first and they get that heavy, I mean, Fox Farm soil sometimes is, is too hot for some of my strains. And I highly recommend to anyone 
when you are doing work with your plants and you put the soil in a pot before you put the plant in, soak that soil really good with water and let it set for a while. We call that cooking, cooking the soil or preparing it. Um, and that adding of water and then letting that water kind of dry out on its own will help break down some of those harsher uh, nutrients. Um, meaty terpenes, cherry black cherry. Oh, about various terpenes and, and how to get them. Right now, um, the, the, the spectrum of that light, the color of the light has a lot to do. Like I said, blue brings out the sweet. The red to me is bringing out the sour. That's what I'm noticing. Now, again, some people prefer the sour, as in sour diesel or in some of the cheeses or some of the uh, more diesel -y things that you want that sour. So you may, you know, uh, with that type of a grow, uh, use a more red leaning light in that regimen. But for the sweets, for the fruity sweets, I just, the blues really bring those out for me. The blue lights, the higher Kelvin uh, number. Um, uh, too much tends to be very dark. The plants will burn up. Yep. Uh, another thing, um, as I mentioned earlier, that um, light tends to break down the cannabinoids and the terpenes. So we tend to harvest before the lights come on. One of the regimens I've been using on the indoor and a lot of people are right now is we get to the end of the flush, uh, the end of the grow entirely, we're ready to harvest and we like to leave those plants still in the dirt, still hanging on to their you know, life, but in the dark uh, for three days. We can go even longer than that. And my basic regimen kind of goes like this when I'm working with indoor plants. My watering is usually about every uh, four days, three, four, or five days, somewhere in there, depending on the size of the pot, uh, uh, when the plant was put in, those types of things, but generally about every four days. So I have the day that I water, and when I water, my plants are kind of drooping a little bit. They're starting to show that, oh, we're thirsty. I'll, I'll water them, feed them, do whatever, um, and they will perk up within 20 minutes to an hour. Those leaves will pray. They'll go in the upward position and, and be like so for a while, um, uh, for the first day. And then the second day, they'll kind of come down and the third day a little bit more. And then by that fourth day, they're drooping again. So I like to try and time it that 72 hour, uh, dark cycle to when I'm at the end of that, uh, water cycle where they are beginning to droop and then uh, give it that three days of darkness. At the end of that three days of darkness, because they were already beginning to dry up, those larger fan leaves are already starting to, to dry up and crinkle right on the plant. And I will then cut that whole plant, take it and hang it uh, upside down in a dark space. And I like to leave those uh, larger shade leaves on um, to just kind of protect the buds for a while and then it's it's all kind of subjective by how dry that bud is getting when i will trim off the rest of those uh leaves um so um important to know someone just posted a very good to have a solid dry wet cycle for optimum growth yes and when they're when they get watered they're nice and wet and then they dry up nice that drying up nice allows more oxygen to get to the roots as well um, so something to bear in mind there, uh, curing again, very important, but this sort of starts the curing process that three days of dark and they're drying out at the same time. The, the pot will actually get lighter for me, uh, and be easier to work with as well. Once I cut the plant out of there, hanging them upside down until the buds start to dry and then, um, getting them into now a mesh hanger. I like the mesh hangers used to use the paper bags back in the day and sometimes you know in an emergency situation i still will but the paper bags supposedly tend to help spread uh certain uh, molds and and fungus um uh so we 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 avoid them botrytis i think is, is one of the main ones um can you cure for too long not if you're doing it right 
Uh, again, it depends on your strain. If you have a heavy hitting indica, that thing might be at its shelf life end six months to a year after. Um, but if it's if it's a, a right uh, strain, um, then uh, it'll go into the jar nicely. Now, the only thing about going into the jar I recommend is that when you're going from the mesh into the jar, you want to pay attention a couple times a day, every couple hours, check up on that. Because if there is any moisture in those buds at all, um, they will show up and the whole bud will get wet again in the jar. Even though it felt dry when you put it in, the, the moisture from the stem will actually wick out um, into the rest of the flower and cause it to be wet. And you don't want them to be wet in the jar. When you do get it to that point, um, and that point is judged by when you take a flower and you bend it and it snaps, the stem in the middle of it has an actual crack with a nice snap to it. Um, that's when you know you're, you're good in a jar and you keep checking in that jar, you know, at least once a day for a couple of weeks um, then after that couple of weeks and you're still getting the, the stem to snap, they're good in that jar for a, a good amount of time. Keep them in the dark, in a dark and cool place. And, um, they, they'll cure out wonderfully. I've been using clear glass for the longest time, but I've just recently, I now have some in the blue glass that I've had for three years and that's working out really nicely. Um, when that chlorophyll breaks down, I'll put it this way. The, it was Vanna Luna and some of my uh, happy pussy that I cured for three years um, that um, they're tasting. It's the closest thing I'm smoking to the Thai herb that I remember from back in the day. Um, so it, it has its merits and it has its benefits. Now I got a question up here. What traits make a flower full flavor, mouth coating flavor, perfume essence? Do certain terpenes produce this full flavor compared to other terpenes? Yes. And it's the combination of those terpenes. And terpenes are really, really um, subtle and weird in, in just their, their presence. When, when I'm just beginning to study them now on a scientific level, and it's just these, these minor little ratios where if one terpene is below another terpene, it will be like, say, oranges. And, oh, there we got oranges. And when it just goes above the other, oh, all of a sudden it turns into grapes, you know? And it's a little oxygen molecule here or a hydrogen molecule there that are the differences between geraniol, geraniol or how we pronounce it, uh, beta caryophyllene through... Um, the limonene and the things that make the oranges and, and chocolates and tobaccos and chemical astringents. <coughs> and it is, you know, uh, grow technique, what uh, things you're feeding to the plant, which is why I'm a very st strong uh, proponent of using as little as possible. It's, uh, out here is here in Michigan, man, here in Michigan, one thing that we have here is the soil that other places do not have. What those glaciers did and how they pulled that soil and scraped it and did all these things to make different rocks and minerals and stones. And, and it's concentrated in various areas. And, and wine growers already know this. You look around Michigan and there's a lot of wine around Paw Paw or up by uh, Traverse City, you know, up, up this way. Um, and wherever you grow good, good wine or any place that grows good tobacco generally grows good herb. And when you, I, we, we call these sweet spots, all right, that's a sweet spot. And if you happen to be, your land is on one of these sweet spots, my God, by all means, uh, utilize that to your advantage. Um, the example I like to give is with, uh, orange bud. Uh, say that you are growing out all these different strains and you notice that this one strain in your backyard or your field um, is orange. And my God, that's the most orange I've, I've ever smelled. If, if there's some way you can find a male counterpart to that plant um, from, you know, that specific strain that you got the orange from in the first place, or if you can self that by applying the chemical, you know, either silver, sil sil silica, or uh, gibberellic acid or whatever it is to make that female plant put out a male 
uh, pollen sac and pollinate itself and grow it out again next year. You can, you know, breed it and grow it in that environment, in, in that soil. And that, that orange is hanging in there or even getting more orange. You're on to something. And um, there's a lot of value in that. You could become the go-to person for orange bud. If, if that's the case and you successfully dial in this regimen that is causing you to come up with this wonderful orange bud that's from the soil in your backyard. You know, they say California's got the sunshine, but Oregon's got the soil. And it's, it's um, notable when you look at the apples that grow here and the cherries that grow here. They're not like anywhere else. Uh, the, the Michigan apples and the Michigan cherries have a very unique flavor to them. And we can impart the same thing to cannabis, again, just simply by uh, paying attention. Um, so uh, you got to play with that. You got to be the artist. You have to delve into that palette and, and see what you come up with. Um, we have aid now and that we are able to have these things tested, but be careful with the testing because it might not reveal what you expect it to reveal. Um, there's a lot of surprises yet to come there, especially with the terpenes, I, I'm certain. Um, so hopefully uh, that helped uh, with that question. Someone else here is, have you ever, have you worked with uh, any cultivars that produce a pine aroma? Yes, pine, Christmas trees. Um, that's kind of the, the Lebanese uh, side of things. I've, I've always said the, the uh, Lebanese red and the Lebanese blonde tended to have a lot of that cedar. To me, cedar, I think, is the, the pinnacle. Pine is a little below cedar, but I know what you're talking about, that sweet green pine uh, flavor and aroma. I can't guide you to any particular strains right now. I'll get around to them. Um, I have a, My flow right now tends to have more of the woody uh, we call that woody. Woody is the big basic uh, because in the woody, then you have the pines and the cedar and then things like oak and other hardwoods, maples, hickories um, that that have that, that characteristic. Um, and can plants absorb flavor through the soil? I'm not sure so much about the soil. Uh, it is what you feed them. Um uh, so, uh, bearing that in mind, but things that are in the room or what you're curing your bud next to, if you're curing your bud next to a big open chunk of chocolate that you put in the jar, the cannabis will absorb that chocolate flavor, um, without having to put any kind of chemical on the plant or feed the plant, you know, blueberry juice or whatever the heck things are that, 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 that people do, um, but that, that's, it, it is possible. So it's, we are what we eat and it's, it's the same with plants. So if it's present there uh, in the soil or if we're adding it to it, then uh, it can impart something. But I like to do this as naturally um, as is possible. Uh, how do you force female plants to push out feminized seeds? It's with a chemical, uh, gibberellic acid or silver silica uh, you, you look it up online, the uh, male-inspiring uh, hormone. Uh, you can go the other way, too. You can turn males into females, and it's a different chemical that does that. Um, but what it is is you have your, your bud when it's in flower and it's growing, and it's, it's, as it's growing, we spray this chemical right on that plant on the surface of it, and it absorbs it. And that flower that you sprayed it on that absorbed it is going to shift its uh, sex from being female to putting out male flowers. Um, and some strains won't have pollen, bear that in mind. They will be sterile, so it only works on, on specific and uh, certain strains. But once you get that male flower producing on that plant and it's making pollen, you put that pollen onto the pistil um, that the female plant has right there. And it should be an exact replica of that female plant. Um, I don't use, I don't, I don't do this. Um, we tried with the flow because flow never once I, I, that plant has been near death. I don't know how many times in the, she's, she's been alive since 1991. So we are going on 30 years that, that, that plant has been alive. 
Um, never seen a male flower on it ever, no matter how badly she's been stressed. And we wanted to do a preservation on her because having almost lost her that number of times, this oh, let's, you know, preserve her as, as best we can. Uh, we're going to give it a whirl with the blueberry, I think, here pretty soon and just see what happens. Um, but I, I just don't have the time and space for it. Um, the one thing I found about feminized plants is they don't have the appeal to me that the non-feminized version of them do. I learned this way back in the 90s with um, White Widow. And I used to smoke White Widow and, and it, you know, it had a certain characteristic to it. And then the feminized White Widow came along and it was just, you know, one step lower on the rung of quality. In, in my opinion, and it just didn't ring the bell the same way the non-feminized version did. It's like we made it a little more generic um, by making it um, female only. And I understand why, why people want feminized seeds. You know, they've had accidents in their garden and, you know, oops, all those seeds, especially from a, from a hermaphrodite, uh, they don't bear that much value. Um, so, yeah, I understand why, why people want to do that. But realistically, um, you want to um, avoid that as much as possible, in my opinion. Uh, question, as an individual who wants to work seed lines in the future, how can we as a society help create legal avenue for cannabis and breeders? Uh, there's a, a website. Check out breedersbest.com. Uh, we're working on that right now. There is a lawyer that's trying to, we're, we're approaching the cannabis genome and what work like people at me are doing the same as songs. All right. Yeah, there it is. Just popped up on there. Breedersbest.com. It's, it's a work in progress. It's something that's just coming together. And to then whoever came up with the song, like my song is blueberry and my song is flow. And if anyone wants to use that song, you know, going into the future or something similar to it, there's the whole uh, concept of um, royalties and, and, and dealing with that aspect. Um, there's another, uh, uh, some other people that are working on the uh, terminologies. Uh, Jerry White uh, is one person. I know that's his name. And he's been, and all of these classifications uh, like right now with my seeds, I say that uh, on the seed pack, if you want to play around with this and do some genetics on your own, fine, that, that, that's allowed. Um, I used to say on the old seed packs that if you wanted to market in these, that the commercial aspect of it was prohibited. And now I have on there that it is, you know, by permission only. So if you do want to do something along that lines, you have to reach out um, and attempt to make that uh, connection with the person who's ever song that is right. And that's what this breeder's best is supposedly going to, uh, help work out a, a lot of these things. Uh, but as far as P you doing it on your own and for your own hobby sense or for sharing with people or for getting medicine out to people, I have no, no problems with anyone, uh, uh doing that. I, I think it's, it's wonderful. And, um, keep keep doing it by all means it's just when it comes down to you start making money off of it especially by delving into genetics and you're competing um and and there are other other people involved um at that point in time so hopefully we'll we will be able to work this out i do like the concept of what's going on at breeders best um so uh, maybe this 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 will work itself out but there are all these various um uh, labels that people have created as to what is allowed from being fully allowed to being pretty, uh, strongly restricted. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's Monsanto has been doing this for a long time. Well, there is no more Monsanto. It's Bayer now. Bayer bought Monsanto. Um, but, uh, uh Burpee, the Burpee seed company. I mean, you got to look at it this way. Let's just say someone goes into tomatoes and using heirloom, uh, seeds, who does the work, comes up with a blue colored tomato that tastes like blueberries. And we call them blueberry tomatoes. And you market them and you package them and you put them out on the shelf. You can't just go into the, you know, into, uh, um, uh, who's the opposite of Home Depot, the other 
Lowe's, yes, Lowe's. I don't know more Home Depot or boycotting Home Depot for whatever reason. Menards or whomever. And you can't just buy that uh, seed off the shelf, take it home, breed it out and go, oh, here's my version of blueberry tomatoes. Um, well, you can. You can go and do that. And I, I'll tell you from experience right now, the lawyers won't bother you unless you start making a bunch of money at it. Because once you start making money, lawyers are like sharks and money is like blood and they will come swimming around um, for you for that. Um, so that, that's kind of a basic commonsensical and, and respect aspect of it, I, I think, is, is a way to look at it. Um, now, you know, maybe you want to take it to another level and make grape tomatoes or whatever. Still, it would be to your best interest to attempt to contact the creator of the blueberry tomato first uh, to make sure that that's kosher. And and don't get upset if the creator of the blueberry tomatoes is so damn busy that they can't get back to you right away um, because that's where it is right now. I mean, a lot of things are opening up and unfolding and um, I, per personally for me and my, my genetics and, and my scheme of this, I have other people that I have to be concerned with now, lawyers included. Um, and so they're, they're kind of the ones that, that deal with that aspect of those negotiations and whatnot. Um, so hopefully that answered that question. We got new comments on here. Oh my God. Feminized isn't as stable as plant. No, no, no. Feminized seeds aren't stable. If you go breeding with feminized seeds, you can end up with a hermaphroditic mess. Um, so that's another aspect of that to consider. There, you know, if you just want to grow it out for your smoke, that's one thing. But if you're going to be breeding, I highly uh, recommend not using feminized seeds um, in 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 breed work. Is drafting or cloning branches from different plants onto? Yes. Oh, that is. Um, what is that called? That is called grafting. And it's done in the fruit industry all the time. Um, many cherry trees and grapes and whatnot, the strains that we love, the grapes that we love, don't grow on their own from seed. They, they are, you know, they get eaten by pests or they succumb to all different kinds of, of ailments unless they are grafted onto a different strain's rootstock. And then that means then that we can produce this wonderful grape in quantity, en masse, with the protection that the other uh, cultivars um, rootstock brings to the equation. So yes, it is very much possible. Um, I've never done it myself. I'm, I'm curious about it. Um, and it's as simple as you have two branches and you just sort of cross the branches, hack them you know, cut into them where they're going to be stuck together, wrap something around it there, and it will put out roots and you will cut from the plant and then plant that new thing in, into the ground or the one that has been grafted onto the other. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's mainly for um, health issues of the plant um, and bringing the very desirable flavors to uh, commercial production, to be able to commercially produce those things. Because the, the really good stuff, it, it's rare. It really is rare. And it really is hard to replicate, to keep going. Um, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason that blueberry is what it is right now, because that particular mother and that particular father did clone. They actually did clone and, and reproduce. And anyone who's, you know, I, I, a lot of these are flipping by me now. So if I missed your, your question, I'm sorry. I didn't um, uh, mean to, but uh, we're trying to stay on top of this here. Um, what's your take on growing seed found in really good herb from a dispensary? Well, you know, it's hit or miss. Bag seed, I mean, that's, that's where my stuff came from was bag seed, but it was all seeded uh, back in the day, which, I, you know, so, you know, um, the great sativas of yore that I was talking about, they were all seeded. They were all hermaphroditic to some point. I think it's a characteristic of tropical herb. And it's not until we're getting out of the tropics and into that glandular stalk trichome that we were actually able to really separate um, those sexes out. Um, the hash, same with all the hashes, they come from the, the fields are seeded. That is seeded herb. And in my opinion, seeded herb, I prefer the effect 
from seeded herb as opposed to sensimia. Sensimia may be more potent, but it has a narrower range of effect, whereas the seeded herb I found has a broader um, effect on me. So uh, going into the future, or especially if we start importing from the tropics, that's one thing that we're going to have to you know, be aware of and put up with. Some are more hermaphroditic than others. Um, where, you know, like some of the tie, some of the great old tie that came on the stick, there would maybe only be one or two seeds in every other bud on them. The rest of it was, was pretty, pretty sensimia, uh, seedless. Um, but, uh, so, so whereas the, like the Guerrero and green that, that I had back in the day, that was almost solid seed. That was more weight by seed than there was bud in there. It used to crack me up people back in the day. Oh, I take all the seeds back to the dealer. So well, you know what you're buying. We don't, you know, dealers didn't shove a bunch of seed into your bag to dump it off on you. That's just the way it came. Um, stems, that's another story. You can pull those out pretty much more. Um, but don't, don't fear the hermaphrodites or the seeds, especially in the tropics. If we're going back to the tropics, I think it's really sad what I see in Jamaica because in Jamaica back in the day, they were all heady sativas, these 18 foot tall plants that just grew over themselves, uh, massive bushes that were next to impossible to manicure, um, very leafy. But, oh, my God, the effect of that finished product was just phenomenal. Nothing like what we have now. So we need, I think, be a little more tolerant and, and open to the possibilities in terms of uh, uh, that aspect, the whole hermaphroditic um, aspect, and to bear that in mind uh, going into the future anyhow. Um, there are so many. The rarest we found is we have a strain that smells exactly like apple pie. Okay, cool. Nobody in our industry has seen anything like it. Cool. And that's that's what we're looking for. And does it replicate? Can you do that one more time? Or did you just luck out on that apple pie this year, this season? Um, if you can replicate it, run with it. Uh, you know, that, that that's my advice. The fruits and the woods, they're all kind of related. All these smells are, are very much related. When you look at the science of it, how you see that just, again, a little hydrogen atom put on here or a little oxygen atom over here changes lemons into oranges. You know, it, it just, it, it's really fascinating um, how, how all that works. It, it's, it's, it bears um, more, more study for sure, especially with, with cannabis. And I know that certain industries have done this, fruits, uh, teas, mints. The next most cacophonous or odorous uh, species out there, I think is mint because there are mints that smell like just, just about anything as well, but I've never seen anything like cannabis. Cannabis can replicate just about every smell and taste that is out there. And I know of no other species that is capable of, of doing what, what cannabis does. Um, Hermaphrodite traits and wild cannabis is a positively selected evolutionary trait guarantees the plant will survive into the future. Yep. Yeah. The plant, you know, nature knows what it's doing. And so be open to these, the, to these possibilities, to these various subtle effects on things that, um, you know, that are out there. Um, and, and keep those good notes so that you, you know what it is that got you to that point. You know, if you, if you end up using, oh, I'm going to use five different new variables now. And then you see something at the end, how do you know which one of those five variables it was or a combination of them? Um, and the, the level of, of complexity that we are going to witness going forward that I've seen just in what I've done with this plant, who hold on tight because there, there, there's a lot going on there. A lot going on there, and I think we're we're actually our cannabis community is going to stand science on its ear, um, and and that's just another thing to uh, take into consideration. Here's a good question: What size pots do you recommend for indoors? Seven gallon, too big or too small? Depends on what you're doing. Um, I they, they, we've got right now some people online are doing the uh, beer cup challenge they call it, and you take a I don't know 16 ounce or a 28 ounce beer cup, 
and grow your whole plant in and a whole bunch of different people do the same strain in this one beer cup to see how it goes. It has to do with numbers. When you're only allowed 12 plants and that's all you can grow, my advice to you is this, go big. Go with the biggest pot you can do. Right now, I'm going with 20 gallon pots, all right? And they get they get up to like I said 300 gallons. You can have a pot that big. Um but 20 gallons tends to do it for the indoor environment and and um, you can get over a pound of bud off of one plant on an indoor garden um, with with big enough root space. It depends on the strain as well. Certain strains really appreciate their root space um, a lot more. If you're having trouble with your mother plants and they're not just really keeping up, bear that in mind. Also, here's another thing with roots. Um, when you go to transplant and you take the plant out of the pot and you see that root ball right there, it should be completely bright, snow white, just as white as can possibly be. If there is any yellow in those roots at all, brown, any of those, you know, off colors off of that bright white, take them off. If they're wrapped to go, you know, together, if they're bound together in a, in a circle at the bottom of the pot, take that out of there just cut it right out um you, you'll your plant will appreciate you for it because instead of having to fix its sick roots the plant would much rather just put out new fresh roots and and you'll see that on the production side of it uh as well one other thing um keeping my mother's going uh this is another handy uh, tip I do it outdoors. So I have my mother plants that are indoors and in their, in their pot. Generally, you know, in the past, it was always up to about a five gallon at the most, maybe a seven gallon bucket. And um, I'll be taking clones off that all year. Spring is coming up and I'm going to take that mother plant outdoors. I'm going to dump the thing on its side, slip the bucket off of it. I've got those roots sitting right there. I just like to take a shovel right to that whole bottom of the root ball and just cut it off. Put that plant in the ground late April if you can, if the frost is allowing you, definitely into May is, is, is good. As late as into June, even now, you can even be putting your stuff outdoors now and it will still have enough time to react. It will revitalize itself. Um, as, as plants get weak and they get sick, they'll, you can tell by the number of leaflets, just like when it's going into flower. And say you have nine leaflets on a leaf, and then it goes down to seven, and then down to five, and then down to three, and then down to one. Um, if your plant is stressed to that level where it's just one, and you put it outdoors in the spring, um, you're going to see that growth come back. And then it's going to go from the single leaflet to three, back to five, back to seven, back to nine. Whatever it is that strain was uh, utilizing as its... Um, uh, shade leaf number of leaflets um <clears throat> that's you, you know by oh mid late july you'll see that on your outdoor plants and it's just back to this vibrant state of wonderful health with the sun beaming down on it that's when you take your clones for next year off of that plant that's outdoors there in in july um and take that cut uh, and that'll be your mother throughout the rest of the year until next year when you can put it back outside again. Um, and this really, this keeps them going in a big way. This rejuvenates these plants. Um, and I've been using this method, like when I say flow, for example, it's almost 30 years old. They don't have the 30 year old mother in one pot. It's recloning her every year, um, and rejuvenating her outdoors as much as possible to uh to to get that going um and what do we have here 620 yep okay we're we're kind of getting to the end of this here let me see if there's any other questions organic amendments and the company i was using they quit doing it. it's a nature's nectar i think was that it there's um and I can't find them here anymore and or 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 online but they're out there just make sure that they are they're certified organic um, uh, bud swell, the super crop, uh, what's it? it's bat guano. 
um, is another worm castings and bat guano. Those are my two go-to uh, worm castings for the nitrogen, the bat guano for the phosphorus. Um, and in any organic form, our, our nice soil, uh, amen, amen, things that you can add. Um, worm castings, you pretty much you can't go wrong with. It's, it's kind of hard to burn if you're getting pure worm castings. You have to be a little more careful with the bat guano, but you can make a tea out of it. Um, so there you go. Uh, teas uh, are, are wonderful things as well. Just soaking whatever, do a, do a uh, search online for beneficial teas for plants. And there are a bunch of different um, uh, things. The dirt I recommend to use, you can't get here either. Uh, well, other than your nice Michigan soil out in the backyard. Um, it's a company in Oregon called Down to Earth. And they have this pro-organic mix that's a cocoa choir um and it's got moss in it as well but it's one of the most complete soils but i still like to add uh worm castings to it um on top of that you can have it shipped i i bring it with me i'll just bring a truckload when i when i drive out and i come back here um but there are some other uh, uh good things out there oh god i forget their their names the it's got a castle on the bag uh it's an organic mix um and i i see them here as well. Some of them have a gold colored bag. Some of them have a blue colored bag. I'm sorry. I don't know the, the name offhand, but apparently I think we're, oh, we're down to the end and I've got 10% power left on my thing here. So uh, I have no idea who all was out there, but thanks for showing up. Uh, be sure to donate to the uh, PCAP um, and hopefully see you all again sometime soon. If we can do this back in the classroom, that'll be great. Um, other than that, I might see you back here online again sometime. And I think this is, this was recorded as well. So you can go back and archive it at some point in time. So, uh, happy growing to everybody and have a, have a great day. Thank you. And you're welcome. <laughs> and there we go down to earth of us. Yep. There we go. Thanks. Tyne Sweeney. Cool. 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 And um, if you you have a classroom where Ohm of Medicine is where I was doing some Ann Arbor. Cool. And if you'll uh, hit the restroom one more time and then I'll come back and say adieu. Thank you guys so much for watching. This has been awesome. As DJ starts to wrap up, just want to remind you guys about um, our raffle. So I'm going to hand it over to Anton and he's going to let you know how to donate and uh, what we have available for you to win. DJ, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DJ Short. That was an amazing, amazing seminar. As you can see right here, I'm chock full of notes. I can't wait to get started. So just want to bring you a, a bit more information in terms of our raffle tonight. I'm holding here some pretty cool starter kits. I think you all can see right here. Here's one, and then here is the other. Oh, I'm sorry, let me turn it around. Pretty cool, right? So we have two, uh, two raffles happening tonight. Once you donate to PCAP, Send us a screenshot of your receipt and you will be entered in to win one of these two starter kits right here. Um, they're pretty awesome. In fact, I'm going to enter the raffle like a million times so I can like up my odds because these these look pretty cool. Um, everybody, we can't thank you enough for being with us today. Please do not forget to donate to PCAP. Please donate to the PCAP. It, it it would mean a, a, a world of difference. Uh, I can't thank the Ohm of, Med uh, Ohm of Medicine enough for this opportunity. Uh, it, it's been a blast. Um, th Absolutely. Thank you guys. This has been this has been amazing. Yes, thank you, Anton. Um, real quick, before we uh, hand it back over to DJ Short to close us out with any of his final comments, um, I just wanted to remind everyone about growing cannabis in Michigan and uh, the legality behind it. So the three things to know, you must be 21 and up or a medical cannabis patient. 
if that's the case, you can grow 12 plants in your residence. Obviously, if there are people that are 21 and up, you can grow four plants in residence, et cetera. And the plants must be out of view of the public and in a secure area. So even if they're outside, uh, they can't be visible from even above technically. So something like a greenhouse with a lock on it or an indoor grow tent. So with that, anything else you'd like to add, DJ? Thank you so much for joining us. This has been great. Yeah, yeah. It worked out fine. Um, are you hearing me now? Yep, we hear okay. you. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious how, how how many people showed up. Those kind types of things, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm glad everybody did. It seemed to to go well, and and uh, it would be great to uh, be in the classroom again uh, at some point in time. But this works this works as well too. So great. Well, we hope to have you back in the lounge in just a few months. And thank you everybody for watching. Enjoy your night and enjoy your grow experience. And uh, have a great day. Cool. Thank you.